So,
started out uh, about three years ago, and we were the Leo last about a year and a half ago, and I gotta tell you, it, it, feels, it feels right. Um, <laughs> we've uh, just to, a bit of news, we've actually signed a deal uh, to where we will be good as an organization for the next two years. Uh, we'll alternate locations, so we're going to be in Lehigh and Adobe, and we're going to be here. And it's not going to be exactly a one for one, so like next month it's going to be at Adobe and the month after whatever. It's going to be based on who's coming out and all this other good stuff. But just sitting on the board uh, has figured it out to where we at least are solid for another two years. Hey! Uh, as you can see, we actually have a new website coming. Now, I'm retarded, so I thought that if you had a new design, you could kind of just put that on the WordPress and everything was good. Uh, <laughs> apparently that's not the case. So we are uh, in the process of uh, getting it out. We actually just got to do it. So we will have a new site up by next event. I'm extremely excited about that because the one we have currently was supposed to be good for like three, four months, and it's been three years. So uh, now as far as current board members, Maria Corcoran actually is our newest one. She's our director of events. She's not here for dog. Had to put down. Um, so I excuse her this time. But uh, all the other board members stand up. <laughs> He's had to put in a ton of work next to Jake. He's our uh, you know tech dude. He's basically the the god of all web. That's our jocks, our AJ Wilcox. That's David Malbert, our vice president. And back there on the camera is Doc Bernstein or Darren Bernstein. Uh, he prefers Doc. And he is our director of communications marketing. So uh, if you need anything, make sure to touch base with any of us. Uh, we're here to help, uh, and uh, we're good to go. So let's move right along. Right. Upcoming events, we've got July 16th, and it's going to be the Adobe. Uh, for those that don't know, that's in Lehigh, which is a, a bit of a drive. But it's worth showing up. We actually have a strong thing lined up. It's a state search event presented by our friends over at Search Engine Land, for those that are aware of that. And then August 20th, we side with the uh, Park City Mountain Resort. Have you guys heard about the whole Dale thing coming in? Anyway. So we are going to do an event up there in Park City in support uh, of keeping things local. And so it's going to be our first day of event. And we're, we're setting up a uh, high-powered CMO panel. So details to come, but I, I guarantee you're going to want to show up to that. It's going to be... Uh, probably around 1 p.m. in the day, so you can tell your employer to let you off because you're going to learn a bunch of stuff. Anyway, uh, we'll, we'll send out the stuff when we have it. 
Uh, as far as job opportunities, let's bring up AJ here. Our jobs are to kind of walk you through what we got going on. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Um, ooh, this microphone is very nice. Okay. Um, so we have two cool, really cool job opportunities on the job board right now. For those of you who don't know, if you're looking to hire, definitely, and you're looking to hire in the online marketing space, uh, there is no better place to, to post a job than, than the job board on slcsem.org. It's slcsem.org slash jobs. Um, the crowd is right. So that out of the way, uh, two really good opportunities. Um, due to some Wi-Fi troubles, we couldn't actually get the slide for the second one, but I'll just kind of dictate it uh, as it is in my head. Um, so the first one is an account director at ClearLink. Woo! Uh, do we have Okay. Um, anyone know particularly a whole bunch about this position that we could like highlight? Not at all. Okay, cool. <laughs> so you wouldn't be working with any of the really, really excited folks, but uh, it's clearly like, so it's awesome. Um, so yeah, account director, uh, you are managing account managers. Uh, it's consistently voted one of the very best places to work in the whole state. Uh, it's in North Salt Lake. Um, so, you know, great benefits. I, I hear from Davey all the time about how, how killer the benefits are. So, um, and anyway, it's, it's a senior level account manager position. So if you're looking for that kind of thing or you know anyone who is, definitely refer them. Uh, you can actually apply directly on slcsem.org slash jobs. And, uh, and the next position is actually from Boostability. And I know we have Boostability representation oh. here. So. <laughs> so this is actually a content director position. Um, Really, really cool given the crowd that so many of you guys are content focused. Um, so definitely check that out. It just barely hit the job board. Fresh, steaming, it's awesome. Um, sorry, steaming is the wrong word for that. <laughs> we'll say it's still hot. Uh, not cool down there. Um, anyway, boostability is voted, well, it's actually. Uh, it's steaming. <laughs> steaming, not steaming. Um, it is Utah Valley, the Utah Valley Magazine's number one fastest growing company. I think that's the, the reference. Um, cool company. This position is actually located down in Orem, Utah. Um, so if you're if you're looking for that, which I assume a lot of you uh, could fit that bill, definitely check that out. Again, slcsem.org/jobs. Uh, thank you very much. I'll hand it back to Ryan. I gotta tell you, one of these days you're gonna get fairly boost. In a, in a ring to, to do now. Uh, just uh, as an FYI, you know, coming back here was kind of like we stalled before me for obvious reasons. But when Elizabeth and I kind of started this thing out, you know, we, we got our, our start due to uh, a couple of, of people that I want to highlight because we're here three years later because of them. One of them is, uh, is progression. Our, is Ashton here or anyone else? Progression. Uh, be proud. Because, yeah, give them a round of applause. Because honestly, when we started out, we had a free event over at Salt Mountain. So that was funded by Progression. They continue to be a sponsor to this day. And I want to thank them quite a bit. Uh, they're an amazing company. If anybody's looking for anything, Josh Ashton is a great dude. They have a good thing going on over there. I can't thank them enough. They've been with us the whole time, literally. Uh, the other one is Ash Buckets from SEO.com. Um, there's, I know some SEO people here, SEO.com people. So we really do appreciate them and coming back here really started to, to make me think about that a bit. So just wanted to highlight them. Uh, thanks again. Tell Josh I said hello. And uh, let's, uh, we got some exciting coming up. Where's our clear, clearly people again? Where are they at? Woo! All right. <laughs> now, this came to my attention just the other day. We don't want to be the only option here for online marketing. You know, I like to conquer the world, but really we want to be a comprehensive resource. These guys reached out, they told us about this uh, amazing event, and so I want them to kind of present because I think about 80% of you are going to want to go. <laughs> cool. Are you managing the slides? Okay, awesome. Sweet guys, so yeah, we have an event next week, uh, next Thursday actually. It's kind of an exclusive event. It's thrown for our brand partners and we're bringing some big name speakers out to Park City at Stein Erickson. But we decided to release uh, a limited amount of tickets to the digital marketing community in Salt Lake and kind of let them come up and be a part of this event. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, next slide. Um, 
one of the big name speakers we have, we have a plenty, of, we have a lot of good name speakers. Google's going to present, but there's two ones going to be really good at the event. And the first one is Tim Ash. Um, he is the CEO of SiteTuners and best-selling author for a uh, landing page optimization book, which is really good. And uh, he is going to kill it. He specializes in neuro neuroscience and neuromarketing, and he's going to be able to tell you guys after you're done basically how to convert browsers into buyers for landing pages. And he's worked with some really big names as far as Intuit, Ford, and etc. The list just goes on and on. Yeah, he's another one. So yeah, this, we're really lucky to have him come. He's a great following too. So yeah, do these guys can go our next presenter. So our other presenter, I'm sure a couple of people have heard of him. Who's heard of Williams? So, uh, Will uh, Will Reynolds will be speaking as well. Um, his topic is: Are you writing the content people really want? And are you sure? Um, and so he's going to be speaking on a similar topic to tonight. Um, but it's going to be a really, really great presentation. It's going to be kind of a, a little bit more intimate than uh, SMS Advanced or MozCon would be. Um, so you'll get a good chance to, uh, to listen to him speak, to meet him. Um, and then we will be doing both breakfast and lunch um, at the Confluence Conference. So. Yeah. Okay. So we're giving away tickets. The first ticket will be given away um, by a retweet contest. So just trying to get the word out about Will Reynolds and Tim Ash coming to Salt Lake, coming to Park City for Confluence. Um, we have already re we've already tweeted out. Yeah, we just we, yeah we tweeted out about like an hour ago now. So all you guys even have to do to enter is just retweet and follow us, and then we'll announce the winner tonight. So two simple things to win a really good ticket. And it's at Fairlink is the, the Twitter handle. So, And then we have yep. another ticket yep. that we'll be giving away. Cool. Yeah, right up there. At Fairlink is the one you want to follow, and, that, and that's where the tweet is living right now. And yeah, the second one. So we want to see who's a powerhouse at this event tonight using the hashtag SLCSEM. So it's probably going to take me a little time to like analyze who's the most like influential person tonight who killed it on Twitter um, using the hashtag SLCSEM. So I'm going to announce that tomorrow on Twitter. So once again, just follow us and then go to town with the hashtag SLCSEM. Create some really engaging tweets and connect with people. And that's how I'm really going to judge this, because that's how social works, which is being really good at engaging. That's what works. So yeah, those are the two contests we have. And uh, yeah, the last information, and this information also can be found under the hashtag Confluence on Twitter. So if you can all write this down really quick, it's there. Um, yeah, so and we're going to offer you, if you don't win tonight, a discount that ends this Friday. It's $49 off our ticket. And uh, the promo code's pretty easy to remember, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're offering you this uh, discount code. and. We hope you make it up there, and it's going to be a really good time, guys. It's going to be like awesome, like a really small group. We're just going to have an amazing time. I am going to be there. Now, I didn't tell you the price. I think it's $250 for that one, right? Yes. So $250, and I'll say you 50 Get out there. Will Reynolds is amazing. Tim Ash is amazing. They didn't tell you everything else. Uh, Google's showing up. Uh, Santa Claus is showing up. Too, right? so, uh, now, on to our first speaker, who I gotta be honest, I'm, I'm pretty stoked about seeing. So you better not let us down. All right, uh, Dan Bishop, everybody. Now he uh, he's got 10 years. First for some some big companies out there. Let's uh, let's see what he has to say. <laughs> to give high fives around the room, but the music was a little delayed. Doc. What? <laughs> well, that, that format didn't work out so well, so hopefully 
the other formatting was better than this one. Anyway, uh, I don't think anybody knows who I am very much here. Anybody know who I am before I got here? Yeah. Yeah. Two, two people. Two people know who I am. Um, right now, I uh, work with Utah Business Magazine and Media One to do some content and solution stuff. So if you want some content help afterward, hit me up. Also, my Twitter handle is there. So when you hear awesome stuff I say, you can uh, tell people that I'm awesome. So, and I blog at Content Hook. Is my personal blog. Anyway, start this off. Talk about what. Uh, well, who here is running a social page for someone? Organization? Uh, what? Ten people? Who? Uh, who's doing blogging for a company? A lot of you. Who's managing someone who's doing that stuff? So pretty much, pretty much, most people here are in that boat, right? I just want to go back to what social media really is a little bit. This is uh, some girls from my graduation class, 1996. Anybody 1996 here? Yeah, yeah. All right. So this girl, her name was Jennifer Strickley. When I was a junior in high school, she called me. She, she broke up with her boyfriend. She called me up. And I was way too afraid because her boyfriend was bigger than me, so I did not go to her house. Anyway, so this is what you see. People posting old pictures, right, of high school days. This is her about a year ago with her two, two kids. She is a single mother. And this is her in April, about a month before she died from cancer. And I'm kind of bringing this heavy topic because on social, this is your competition. Your competition is not your competitors. It is people dealing with real issues, real problems. You have both a friend and you have an old high school friend um, that are having real issues. And so when they're scrolling through the feed, they see something like this. And then they see something like, buy my product, it's awesome. What are they going to do? There's, what are they going to do? It's pretty much a no-brainer. So social and content, you got to remember this is a human, a human experience. Now, uh, and combined with those really human experiences that we that we that we see on social, uh, Facebook said that the number of pages liked by people it's 50% more than a year ago. Now, what does that do? Okay, so we've got the same thing over and over, right? We have a bigger audience trying to get our attention. And it turns into just, just crap online, right? It's just the same thing over and over, especially when we're, we have an audience of people having cancer or maybe some funny things too, but real human stories. And who's, uh, who's experiencing a low Facebook reach right now? You are lower than you used to, lower than a year ago maybe? This is one of the reasons why you have much more people that are posting all the time, and we're having things that are not, not relevant. Okay, I'm going to scroll through this a couple times here. You can read this later. This is a little bit of how Facebook sorts the news feed, right? I'm not even going to go here because I don't want to talk about it too much. All right? Here's TechCrunch Head article, too. Here's a, here's a graphic of their little algorithm there, okay? Forget all of that stuff, all right? There's an algorithm that Facebook has, but it doesn't really matter. You can't, you can't tweak that algorithm just because you know how it works. Unless you have great content, right? So you hear that sometimes. Unless you have great content. Well, keep dreaming because there's no such thing as great content. Well, why is there no such thing as great content? Because everybody's making tons of content. There's, I don't even know what quintillion is. Right? And so you got how much of that is great content that are good images that are that look good that are pretty that are I don't know whatever a good story or something you're competing with quintillion amounts of great content so you have great content competing against great content and you go forever competing against great content even great content is irrelevant and gets lost you like the elephant 
Alright, so what, what really is Get Read content? We're going to go a little bit of how uh, with Nature Sunshine, um, they had a, uh, on the next slide, anybody heard of Nature Sunshine? Have you heard of Nature Sunshine? How many people have heard of it? I'm just curious. Uh, more than I thought. But it, it's one of Utah's oldest companies that was very innovative in the 1970s. Um, they were one of the first to encapsulate herbs. But on social, they are old. And they are using, I still use this stuff, by the way, stock photos of some woman smelling flowers, which means that their stuff is healthy, I guess. Um, I can make fun because they're not there anymore. Uh, they're good people, though, but, but they're, they're old. Their social is bad. And so uh, what we did when we got there is really focus on who their audience really is and how we solve those really unique unique personas, those problems they have. Their audience is based on people to stick needles in people's backs to heal them. Right. Who's, who's, who's had that done before? Uh, you like it? Yeah. So I mean, the person that is doing this, this is the audience in Nature Sunshine. This woman is the audience. People doing whatever this is. It's probably tapping. Have you heard of tapping? You tap, tap spots in your head to uh, overcome things. <laughs> but that's who they are. That's who they are. There's a lot of them out there. Yeah. Um, people that shop organic, that's their audience. People that go and that are really want clean food. And practitioners that are herbalists that even put together their own blend of herbs to uh, heal people. That's who these people were. And so we put some strategy together, and uh, here's some of the numbers we had. Uh, this was our best, our best numbers we had um, for a week. And uh, so with 29,000 likes, we had engagement of 32,000. Was uh, was okay. Um, 75,000 clicks, 10,000 likes, and 8,000 shares in that week. Um, what, what's the average? Someone tell me the average engagement rate. Two percent ish. Um, so that was a pretty good engagement. We, we, we averaged about 18, 20 percent. This was a, a good one. And so here's a few of the things we did. I'm going to show a few a few images that we did and posts that we did that was I don't think is great content just to, to look at it, but it's really problem solving content. I want to show the shares and the kind of reaction we got from it. It doesn't need to be awesome, but it solves a problem for these people. Now this is one where it shows the, the pain you might have in your stomach and what, what effect it might have on your health. Um, that went at 870 shares. This is the, uh, and some of this is content we created and other content that we curated. Um, so some of it was other people we shared, like this one is shared from a uh, step in my green world, which does an awesome job. If you want to see a good Facebook page, go to their Facebook page. Um, so this is a, this is basically just a spreadsheet of the type of herb and the antioxidant level in there. Your first impression might not think that's pretty awesome content, but it, it got 600 shares and uh, a bunch of reaction. Here's the one's kind of cool, baby foot, with uh, some reflexology. Anybody do reflexology? Yeah? People swear by that stuff. 856 shares. Here's a hand chart of uh, another reflexology. They love this stuff with Nature Sunshine. And I also want to show you, too, anybody heard you should only have a Facebook post be one sentence long or, or a certain amount of characters? Have you heard that? You hear that all the time. This one has a huge post, right? It's almost a mini blog post that you got a thousand shares on. So don't. The one thing we thought about is don't don't think about what everybody says to do, but just try your own thing and try to create something valuable. There's another one, which is the skin on your face and what it tells you is wrong with your body. You have some dry skin or some acne or something on a certain part of your, your face. Um, you know, your liver might be have a problem. It's very useful stuff for these kind of people, right? And uh, you know, 1,100 shares. This was the, the big one we had. And this was uh, a pretty cool post. Not a great image, though. Pretty easy to make for someone. Um, not, not flashy or anything, but it's got what you crave is what if you crave sugar or chocolate, you probably need some magnesium. And instead, eat some nuts, right? Pretty basic, but. 
Uh, most people will probably want to read that one because it's useful and, and targeted to a specific audience. But it reached 84,000 people that post. Yeah, 2, 000, more than 2,000 shares on that one. Here's another one talking about detoxing your liver. And then on the right, I kind of scrolled down with a screenshot. There's a lot more content that's on there. Uh, very informational, like a blog post again. And that had a similar amount of shares. This is an interesting one, too. The image isn't that great for a Facebook post. It's some bugs on some food. And uh, it's probably, there's almost 500 words of text in there saying that the 10 reasons to, uh, or the 10 ways to keep pets out of your, out of your house. And that had 1,800 shares on that thing. Initially, you probably wouldn't think that's a great, a great post. It, this one's pretty good, actually, some chicken nuggets. <laughs> This one plays to their fears a little bit too. Uh, some of the positives that help them uh, share really well, but also you play on the fears of your audience. And their fear is like processed food. You eat processed food, you're gonna die. You eat chickens, you eat chicken nuggets, you're gonna die. And so I say, you, if you eat chicken nuggets, you're gonna die. Everybody loves that thing. And we did it multiple times. You eat a hot dog, you're gonna die. And people share like crazy. You know what's in fast food chicken? Ah, a dash of dimethyl anti-foaming agent. You put that in there, and those like kind of extreme health people are going to go crazy with it. They want to share it to everybody, their friends, their family. Don't eat this stuff. You eat it every day. I know you do. Your kids probably eat that stuff. My kids want to eat that stuff. I'm scared to death of it now. Okay, anyway, so some results over over about a year. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, it's pretty decent, especially the last one. We did have some promotions in there too. When, when you start putting helpful content that solves a problem, then it's okay to put some, here's a product that's on sale, and here's, here's some information about the product, because you are helping them instead of just putting some irrelevant stuff out there. Um, but again, I want to go back to uh, the first thing we were talking about. It's not about the numbers. It's not about these numbers as much when you're thinking about this stuff. It's, it's this human story. And that this is a human network that we're trying to, that we're talking to. Even whether you're B to C or B to B, it doesn't matter. Some CEO is going to have this issue. Some CMO of whatever company you're trying to talk to is going to have the same issues. And you want to speak to that person one on one. So solve solve for the humans instead of solving for an algorithm. If you solve for the human, the algorithm is going to take care of itself. So when you leave here, um, think about your audience you're trying to, whether you're blogging, whether you're doing any social network, anything you're marketing to, remember this too, is think about what you want to do for your audience. Uh, and what do, you, what do you want to inspire someone, do you want to inspire something? And then, uh, and thanks. So, hopefully you'll have time for the zombie. Stuff, good stuff. Um, for anybody that was looking at that saying 2,000 shares, I can do that. No, I can do that in my sleep. Anybody who does that for SLC, SLC, I'm going to give you a lifetime membership. That's, uh, that's some strong results right there. <laughs> <laughs> lifetime membership? Lifetime membership. <laughs> On the house for $49. <laughs> Up next, uh, we got a dude coming up that's got a few things in development. I'm glad we got him when we did because he's about to go Hollywood on us. You know, people have heard of Max Force because of, you know, World War C and all that garbage. But I got to be honest, the, the Joe Letter series, uh, V Wars, Rock and Ruin, you're about to see a lot of this guy. So you're going to be able to point to this night and say, I remember him. Jonathan Mayberry, everybody. Yes, that is the soundtrack inside my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Hi, folks. Thanks for uh, inviting me here to Utah. It's nice to be back to, to uh, Salt Lake City. It's been a while. And thank you, Ryan, and the rest of the board. And it's great to be here. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not probably the typical speaker you have at these sorts of events. I'm, I'm a writer. I, you know, I write for a living. It's my, it's my day job. So I'm going to talk about that for, for a bit and how what I do in social media kind of uh, got into bed together and made each other happen. Um, I, I started out writing nonfiction. I started selling magazine feature articles while I was a journalism student at Temple University. Back a long time ago, back when dinosaurs ruled the earth. Uh, before personal computers, you know, back when there were typewriters and carbon paper. Um, some of you will remember that. Most of you will think I'm making this up. Um, I, I've since, well, at that point, hello. Um, writing is one of the, writing is one of the things that defines who I am. I am not. No, I'm back on again. Um, I am not the kind of person who fished around for what I wanted to do. I've been telling stories since before I could read and write. I used to tell stories with toys when I was a little kid. Writing is what defined me. I'm always, I've always been a storyteller. When I was in um, sixth grade or seventh grade, when I when I got to, to middle school. I was in an economically depressed, educationally backward part of Philadelphia. Uh, and Philadelphia is not known, even though it's my hometown, not known for its educational standards. It has its moments, but the neighborhood I grew up in was not, not part of any history of education. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood that was intensely racist. My father, who we were not friends, he was the head of the local chapter of the KKK. They met in my house. Um, I was in a, in a neighborhood where we were told the Holocaust never happened. You know, that kind of, a, of an environment growing up. I could very easily have turned out to be a world-class asshole. <laughs> Probably should have, in fact. What saved me from that were books. I, I, and actually, originally, comic books. I was reading a Fantastic Four comic book. I started reading Fantastic Four, yes. I started reading Fantastic Four uh, in 1966 when I was eight years old. And uh, they had a character introduced in the comic uh, known as the Black Panther. He was the first black superhero ever. Never, there had never been a black superhero before Black Panther. And he was the king of an African nation. He was a powerful guy. He was brilliant. Didn't have the same superpowers as the Hulk or Thor. You know, he was almost normal in terms of, of, of physical strength. But he, but he was able to, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Fantastic Four and then fight alongside them. I thought, wow, that is incredibly cool. Then in 1971, they did an issue of Fantastic Four where that character was arrested in a, in a, a, a country in South Africa. Now, they didn't call it South Africa. They gave it a different name in the, in the comic. But it was essentially a, a story about apartheid. It was the very first story about apartheid. For, first time it had ever been in a comic book ever. And Marvel got, took some heat for telling that story. I read that, and like, I'm like, this is, this is weird. You know, I don't understand this. So I went and asked a librarian, does this anything like this really happen? And she gave me a, a magazine article on apartheid. And that information changed who I was as a person. Yes, it, it did uh, kind of create a chink, a chasm between my father and I, which grew and grew and grew, which I'm actually pretty happy about. It gave me a chance to understand the world as it was. It was information coming to me from an unexpected source, and it was entertaining information. It was a comic book with superheroes, but at the same time, I was learning something. That's a concept that I didn't think could, could really be. I mean, the books we were, we were given in school weren't all that entertaining. Um, they were their textbooks, and the textbooks we, you know, we had in schools in, in the early 60s, mid 60s, uh, even into the early 70s, were not particularly well written. They, they've improved a little since. But this comic book changed my mind, changed my, changed my life. Now around the same time, that librarian also introduced me to a few of her writer friends. She was the secretary for a couple of clubs of professional writers, and she dragged me along to some of the meetings. So I'm you know, 13, 14, uh, and I'm meeting guys like Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Harlan Ellison, Arthur C. Clark, um, Theodore Sturgeon, um, meeting people who were the giants of science fiction and fantasy. 
Uh, many of whom I didn't actually know at the time because we did not have the internet and I was not reading science fiction at that point. So when I was introduced to Ray, now you guys all know who Ray Bradbury is, right? Because if, if anyone says no, I'm going to hit you very hard. <laughs> um, when I was introduced to Ray Bradbury, my first you know, reaction, like the librarian said, hey, this is Ray Bradbury. I'm like, oh, do you write too? <laughs> Moderately long silence, and he's like, yeah, I've been known to take a swing at it once or twice. Um, it turns out he's you know, the Marcus Grace fantasist. Uh, and I got to, to meet so many of these other people. And one of the things, uh, something happened around this point that was another turning point in my life. It's very easy for a professional in any field to discount, discount someone who is not uh, an obvious customer. And I was too young to be, and too poor to be going out and buying a lot of books. So they didn't need to sell me on what they did. They didn't need to do anything for me, in fact. Um, they, however, they, uh, the two in particular, Matheson and Bradbury, found out you know, from my librarian that I wanted to be a writer and that I was serious about it. It wasn't just a thing I was saying because I was meeting writers. So over the period of three years when I, when I met them off and on, they took time to talk to me about writing. They gave me information that I, I would not have had. They talked to me not only about the, the art of writing, but the business of publishing, which I didn't know they were two different things. In fact, to this day, most professional writers and most wannabe writers, let's say 90% of wannabe writers, don't know that writing and publishing are two different things. They think they're the same thing. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, they, they took time to give me important information. What they didn't do, and I didn't appreciate it at the time, and I came, I came to appreciate it later on, is they didn't give me what we would now call an info dump. They didn't give me long lectures about information. They gave me something to think about. They would give me a simple paper with titles and say, go look this up. Not book titles, not their own stuff. Subjects, interesting topics, I would have to go look up. And if I wanted to have a conversation with them next time I met them, I would have to, be able, I'd have to know something about it. Matheson, one of the, he wrote I Am Legend. If you've never seen, if you've seen the movies but never read the book, you're missing out. It is a template for all modern thrillers. Every thriller that has been written since 1954 is inspired by, or, or directly or indirectly, by I Am Legend. It's also the inspiration for Night of the Living Dead, even though I Am Legend is about a vampire apocalypse, not a zombie apocalypse. And even the Michael Crichton uh, uh, outbreak type books, like Andromeda Strain, owe, owe a lot to I Am Legend. It's a brilliant book, very short, worth reading. The movies completely get the end wrong. <laughs> really, they do. They, they take the title, and the, the title makes sense if you read all the way up to the last paragraph. It makes a whole lot of sense. And if you don't read the friggin' book and just make a movie based on the outline of the book, you miss the point, as a lot of people do. They miss the core of the message. The message is right there in the title. And uh, some people get it. Anyway. One of the things Matheson told me, it's, it's something that sat in my head for a long time. He said, no more than you, you've been taught. No matter what you know, no matter what you've learned in school, you should know more about every single subject you've been taught than what you have been taught. You have to think it through. You have to go beyond the bit of information, the kernel of information that you get. That was something that, at, at first, I am like, well, that, that sounds like, a, like an obvious truism, and I'm not going to think anything about it because I'm 13. And as I got older, that kept recurring. It's probably the single most important bit of information I've ever, been, I've ever received. It's informed almost everything I've done. It's informed my life as, as, a, as a writer, as, a, as an educator, and I, I do a lot of teaching. I was a college teacher for many years, also a martial arts instructor. Um, it's informed everything that I've done. Give an example. How many of you have studied any kind of martial art? A bit. All right, cool. The thing about martial arts is I know a lot of folks who have black belts in, in karate, aikido, jiu-jitsu, taekwondo, and so on. And most of them can't fight. Most of them are great in the dojo. They're, they can do superb technique. They can, in fact, tell you what most of the techniques actually mean because they don't know. They're imitating what they've been shown. And a lot of imitation can give you a certain degree of mechanical proficiency, but it does not actually teach you to do something or understand it. If you understand the physics of martial arts, you can do many more techniques than you were taught. If you understand the, the, the mechanics of any subject, you can do more with that 
then you should be able to do for whatever level of education in that subject you have. That's part of what goes into writing. It's, it's definitely seen throughout the successful aspects of social media. People take something and they go further with it. They go to the next thing because that's, the way, that's where innovation is. It's also where a lot of um, creativity comes from. Um, for those of you who have journalism backgrounds, and I've talked to a few people who are journalists, uh, either current or former journalists. I was trained as a journalist. One of the things that makes a good interviewer is, to not, is not someone who can ask the obvious questions, but to ask the questions that would be the follow-up questions. The best, best interviews I've ever read are the follow-up questions, the things that go deeper and deeper. That makes for a compelling read. Uh, if you ever read some of the, uh, the better interviews in, um, like Vanity Fair does some great interviews, Rolling Stone does some great interviews, Playboy, yes, some of us also read the articles, does some great <laughs> and it wants uh, great interviews, GQ, Esquire. Some of these magazines do great interviews, and the interviewers are the ones, I keep fading, apparently do them in two different dimensions at once. <laughs> some, of, some of the uh, interviewers are the ones who, who don't just think what the obvious uh, basics of journalism are. They go to the next stage. They, they go a little deeper with it. That makes it a much more interesting article. Now, I, I'm, I'm known for writing horror, for thrillers, for zombies, for comics, for vampires. And what sells my books isn't the fact that I'm writing in popular genres. In fact, if you ask all right, is that better? Does anyone still have an eardrum? All right, so what makes it? Now, a lot of my friends write zombie stories. Max Brooks did World War Z, probably the single best political zombie novel ever written. Uh, Brian Keane did the first demon zombie novel that was fantastic, sold a gazillion copies. Um, Seth Graham Smith did Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, where it was basically a parody satire of, of uh, Jane Eyre type uh, fiction. Um, and there are, a few, there are a few others who have done that kind of thing, have taken the zombie model and written about it in a way that doesn't just imitate the source material. Now, not every, when I talk about zombies, I, I, I start seeing eyes glaze over. Like people are like, I'm not a zombie fan. You don't have to be for this conversation. Um, so you, you can read them. My wife is not a zombie fan. She does not watch Walking Dead with me. Um, my dog does. My dog actually perks up when the zombies moan. So that, that dog is daddy's little girl. <laughs> anyway. So what makes a good zombie story? Now the first zombie story, first of the modern era, what we most often think of as a zombie, the flesh and evil, was Night of the Living Dead. Night of the Living Dead, um, simple premise, something weird happens, nobody knows what, the, the dead rise, they start eating the living, and you can only kill them by shooting them in the head. It's pretty much all that Romero thought through on that story. He had wanted to do I Am Legend, by the way, and he couldn't get the rights. So instead of doing a faithful version of I Am Legend, he did a really interesting copy of it with ghouls instead of vampires. Um, and and what, one side note, even though I love the social commentary and zombie stories, and even though Romero in all of his subsequent zombie stories did in fact put social commentary in, Night of the Living Dead, a lot of people say that it was a, a story about racism in America because you had a bunch of you know, face to face white people attacking a house where there was a black guy a whole lot. That black guy, Dwayne Jones, was the only good actor who showed up for the auditions. Seriously, that's that's why that movie was done. And that's why there was a black man in there. But because every single review said this is social commentary about racism in America, and it's out in the sixties, Romero goes, Yeah, that's exactly what I intended. <laughs> and every single movie after that, he did social commentary. Little side note, and Romero told me that story over drinks one. He now admits it. Um, but the zombie story. So uh, when I said I had to write a zombie story. 
the first and most important thing I did when I plotted out my zombie story is I almost completely ignored the zombies. Because if you write a zombie story about zombies, you're writing a boring story. A boring story. If you're writing a story about vampires and focus on the vampires, you're writing a boring vampire story. If you write a story and focus on the obvious core thing, it becomes tedious very quickly because you get that. You know it's a zombie story. It, it says of the dead in the title. You know, you pretty much got that going in. So what makes a good zombie story? A good zombie story is not about zombies, it's about people. The, the, average, the zombie genre is about a massive shared threat. Everyone is experiencing the same level of threat. It's destroyed the, the infrastructure so that no help is coming. The level of, of disaster strips away our personal affect. We're no longer the people we pretend to be. And every one of us puts on a persona in public. And we have different versions for different people. Um, if, you, if you if you should do this sometime at a cocktail party, watch, watch one person at a cocktail party. Somebody you know. You'll see them act differently um, with, say, if they're talking to a bunch of guys, they're going to get more manly. If they're talking, if they're standing next to their wife and talking to a couple of women, they're going to get less manly. They're going to be more husbandly. Or they're going to, if they're talking to somebody who is more political, they'll be political. They change, to edit themselves for the, the group, the audience. Of course they do. We all do it to one degree or another. And it's not malicious. You know, it's it's who we are. We are theatrical by nature. Humans are theatrical. So a, a massive crisis, something that takes away uh, all of our infrastructure takes away also our affect. It leaves us as you know, just who we actually are. The TV show The Walking Dead, the title does not refer to the zombies. The Walking Dead are the humans. Their lives have been stripped away. Their, everything that defined who they were prior to the beginning of the show is gone. They do not have a comfort zone. They do not have a support system. They don't know who they're going to be because they haven't gotten there yet. They're in transit toward what they hope will be a, 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 some sort of a life worth living. They are the walking dead. That's what Robert Kirkman created when he created that, that comic book and the show that it's based on. Most people don't get the message, but that's the message of the show. It's, so, it's social commentary. It's, it's pretty biting, pretty insightful. Zombie stories aren't about zombies. Um, World War Z is about the failure of governments to, uh, to uh, communicate and coordinate in crisis and also the failure of, of most structures that are there for protection and also of corruption. It's a great story about corruption on all levels, political, social, economic, and so on. It's a great book about that. Joe McKinney's Dead City is an excellent zombie novel about the failure of infrastructure in disaster situations. He wrote it shortly after Hurricane Katrina, so he was obviously going after FEMA. Uh, my book, The Rotten Ruin, four book series for teens, takes place 14 years after the zombie apocalypse. The, the, the apocalypse already happened. There are 7 billion zombies and there are 30,000 people. They live in small fenced-in towns in, in Central California. The story is not about the zombies, even though there are 7 billion of them. The story is about the kids who are being handed a broken world. The parents, who were curators of that world, failed to protect it. Now, I'm at the end of the baby boomer era. My wife, who's 10 years old at the time, was an actual hippie in the village in the 60s. Our generation, we thought we were fixing everything. We were going to fix racism, sexism, and every other kind of ism. We were going to get rid of corruption in the government. We were going to bring peace, love, and understanding between peoples. That was our plan. Have you read the papers recently? So you know that we didn't exactly solve all those problems. We've made inroads, absolutely. We've made, it, we've made many advances since the 60s. But we have a long distance to go. Politics has never been more polarized. Religious strife is constant around the world and within our own country. Uh, the, the economy is tanking everywhere and the environment sucks. So this is the world I'm handing my son and saying, well, I tried to fix it, but clearly I'm incompetent. Here. <laughs> and he's taking it like, give it to me. He's going to fix it because he intends to live on that world for a long time and have kids. He is the one with the optimism, the youth, the energy, and the imagination to take that world, to take the ball and run with it and go further with it. That's his job if he wants to live in society. In Rob Ruin, the kids in the story are the ones with the optimism. All the adults, having lived through the collapse of society, 
all have some vari variation of, of post-traumatic stress disorder. They are mired in their own belief that nothing will work because everything they know has failed. That's the message that they're trying to give to their kids. The kids are getting this message and saying, no, 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 no. Just because that's, that's the central message you're giving me doesn't mean I have to act that way upon them. They're going with a more positive thing. That brings me back to writing, to, to writing and the writing world and social media. That was a real jump that you don't understand so. I, I, When I switched to fiction in 2004, I also switched from being a part-time writer to a full-time writer. You know, I, I did you know, thousands of articles and 20-some non-fiction books and greeting cards. You know the Maxine Landon greeting cards with the cranky old lady? I co-created it. I wrote the first 12 cards. Uh, I, was, I was recovering from injuries sustained as a bodyguard, and I was laying there in mostly a body cast, feeling miserable, and wanted to take it out in the world by being sarcastic, so I decided to write sarcastic greeting cards. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, when I went into fiction, I didn't know anything about fiction. I've been a reader, but not a, not a professional writer. Yet. And right around that time, 2000, uh, for my first novel in 2006, social media was just getting started. There was this new thing called MySpace. Ooh, and Friendster. Remember Friendster? <laughs> Dinosaurs used Friendster. Um, and um, I, had a, I was teaching a class in, in the actual non-fiction book class, and one of the assignments I gave was to give a class, find out about this new thing called social media and see if it is of any value at all to writers. It's 2006. One of the guys in the class, Don, Don Lafferty, you should look him up, Don Lafferty, great guy. Um, he knew nothing about social media before that. He is now a nationally known social media consultant, um, run, does he owns Mingle Social, um, has been a consultant for everyone from Elmore Leonard to people in the Oprah Book Club. I mean, the guy's amazing. So he came back and said, yeah, social media, it, right now, there aren't a lot of writers on it, but it's going to break big. And he and I sat down to strategize how to use social media for my career. Now, I was no one in fiction, absolutely no one. There, you know, I, I was writing my first novel, Rose Red Blues, was an American Gothic vampire novel. So I was going to go into the same market as Stephen King's Salem's Lot and, and similar books, Peter Straub, Robert McCammon, the big heavyweights. Um, I had no footprint in that. And everyone tells you that if you're writing fiction, if you're going to be a novelist, you're not ever going to, to quit your day job. Because less than 1% of novelists make a living at it. Less than 1%. That's a pretty frightening statistic. I didn't like that statistic for me, and I don't accept statistics as prophecy. I think statistics have way too much power in our lives. In fact, uh, we just heard a little bit about you know, that in, with, with our wonderful previous speaker. Um, if you place too much on what they say, you get trapped. It's deliberately put your foot in a bear trap. So instead, I'd say, well, how can, how can we do it and have fun with it. And Don said, what do you mean fun? This is business. I said, yeah, but I won't do any kind of business unless I'm having fun. And he's like, well, oh, I like that. <laughs> we launched into finding out how I could build my writing career and have fun. Now, I have this, this uh, business model that I've been using personally. I won't get involved in any business relationship of any kind unless it's a win-win situation. No. If, it come, if it's a situation where I'm going to come out on top and somebody else is going to take a hit, I won't do it. I'm not a saint. It's just more fun the other way. And I like the fun. I like being the kid who comes to the playground with toys rather than the grumpy kid who's just making it tough for everybody. You know? I, and it's not a need to, to be loved. I just like to play. I like to have fun. So we started having fun. Now, we made some mistakes along the way. I'll tell you about my first mistake. I started a blog about writing. How many of you are writers, show of hands, of any kind? OK, now some of you have to blog about writing because it's your job. If you're writing fiction, for the love of God, do not blog about how to write fiction. <laughs> there is nothing more boring and less useful than another fucking blog about fiction. Oh my god. They all say the same thing. 
here's the query letter, do this, don't do that, and they go over and over, it's the same stuff. And even if it's getting to people who need it, they can find it from the other 10 million people who have it online. It, and I, I was happy because I was getting 500 to 1,000 hits on my post. I'm like, wow, that's really great. Now, we start, that, that, that's about the time we start get, getting access to analytics and seeing how many of those click through to my website or click through to my website and they click through to a purchase point you know, where they can buy one of my books. Those numbers are real damn small. I'm not even sure if you were hitting the 2% thing. What they would do is they would go in there and leave it. And that's it. Um, because it was saying the same thing. Even if it's well written, even if it's useful, it's the same stuff. So then, a long way, I, I had this idea that I'd stop doing that and do something that was more fun. I was, this is right around the time, it's not out there, Patient Your the first book in, in this series came out. Came out in 2008 or 9. Around that time, I said, you know what, I want to do something else. I, it was my first thriller. I, and I don't know anyone in the thriller field. Nobody. So I'm going to educate myself about thrillers and make friends in the thriller field by interviewing thriller writers. So I started interviewing. I created Jonathan Mayberry's Big Scary Blog, which unfortunately is no longer real. You should put the archive up. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And I, I used uh, social media, MySpace originally, to reach out to a whole bunch of folks who were thriller writers. Now, I think I sent out 50 emails, 50 messages within MySpace to interview people. I got one yes, because nobody knew who I was. Fine. I interviewed that guy, Jeffrey Abbott. Um, I sent 50 more requests out, and I said, I just interviewed Jeffrey Abbott. Now I got 25 out of 50. And then a whole, I picked the best names out of that, and then now when I reach out for an interview, I never get none as an answer. Um, I, my, my hits, my unique visitors on the blog jump from a thousand, tops of a thousand, average seven hundred, to seven or eight hundred thousand unique visitors per post. Most of them, probably in, in the early days, all of them, were fans of Jeffrey Abbott, uh, Jeffrey Deaver, uh, James Robbins, Lee Child, the people who were the giants number one bestsellers in, the, in that genre. Their fans were coming to that blog. Of course they were. They wanted, info, and I was a good interviewer. You know, I was a journalist major who, who had that whole thing about doing the second follow-up question. So I, I asked good questions. And I posted up there, and it was relatively short, about six questions. It wasn't about, you know, not the usual stuff like where do you get your ideas, uh, or who, you know, which writers inspired you, because they're the two most boring questions we always get asked. I asked, like, all right, you have an idea. Take us through the steps from idea to bookshelf. What are those steps? You know, what's a pitch session like with, with your editor, and how does that change as you become more successful? I asked questions I needed to know, stuff I couldn't find in other interviews. Uh, when I interviewed um, Charlene Harris, who writes the books True Blood, it's based on, uh, we got 2.2 million unique visitors the first week. That was up. The first week it was up. Uh, within a few months, uh, few, about two months later, um, we got uh, we were contacted by an Italian romance magazine who wanted to buy that blog entry to print in their magazine. Now, I have friends who do it differently, and those are friends that I have been trying to do some sort of intervention. Good example: you all know who Stephanie Meyer is, right? You're from Utah. Twilight. She wrote Twilight. She lives here. Okay. Stephanie Meyer. There are a lot of people who hate Stephanie Meyer because she sold 10 gazillion books. They hate her for that. There's like a lot of pushback against Stephen King. They say, oh, Stephen King, he sucks. No, he doesn't. He's a great friggin' writer. It's just, you would like, that's my 10 minute point, you would like to be a successful, you're not, so it's sour grapes, you know, stop doing it. So there's a lot of pushback, and these people, who, a lot of them who were writers who wanted to then publish that kind of fiction, or what they call real vampire fiction. Think about that for a second. <laughs> they would they use of Twilight and they would slaughter Stephanie Martin. They would tear her apart and they would just savage the books and go on and on. And they were also frustrated as time goes on because I would run into a lot of these people at conventions. They're talking about how difficult it is for them to sell their book. Now, 
Some people think that their Facebook posts or Twitter posts or blog posts exist in a vacuum. That's them and their beloved readers and no one else. My agent, for example, has an assistant who trolls social media to find any reference to any of her clients. I'm her biggest client. So if somebody's out there talking about me, she knows about it. If a book comes across her desk from someone who's out there savaging me, do you think it's going to be kindly received? Of course not. Do you think anyone in publishing is unaware of who is savaging Stephanie Meyer? No. They get these, these queries over their desk, these, these, or these unsolicited manuscripts, from, and they'll, they'll search the name, and they'll see what pops up. Sometimes they'll even search the name and the top names in the genre, like Stephanie Meyer. And they'll see that, oh, yeah, they did a blog post where they said, oh, that, that's, you know, the whole thing with, with, with Edward is pedophilia, they did it, go on and on and on. And they're like, and you want to try to sell a book to us? Stephanie Meyer's books, between the books, the movies, the soundtracks, and all the products, run about $2.5 billion into the entertainment field. What is your book going to do for us? What, is, what are we supposed to do with someone whose approach to social media is to attack? A lot of people think attack is right. And I see this a lot with, with a lot of people who do all kinds of advertising, all kinds of social media. I will not buy a product from any company that uses an ad that slams their competition. I think it sucks, I think it's petty, I think it's childish, I think it's bad advertising. Tell me what's good about yours, but more importantly, tell me what I should have fun with. Tell me what people who are using it are having fun with. Tell me a story about real people and how they relate to it. I'm a story guy. I love, when I watch a, 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 whether it's a movie, a TV show, or a commercial, I look for the story. Am I being told something that engages my, my curiosity as to what's going to happen? Am I being attacked? Am I in any way being um, enchanted by it? I want to know the characters in a story. Uh, there was a, a series of commercials years ago where there were serial commercials, uh, in that each commercial would pick up the last one left off were coffee commercials with a guy who wanted to play Giles and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But it was a nice romantic story that unfolded over a series of commercials. I was enchanted. Bought that coffee. Um, if I, I saw, I was at a, a pharmaceutical uh, event a couple of years ago where they asked me to review some of their commercials and give me their opinion as, as what I thought. They had this really well shot commercial fe featuring John Slatter. He's the guy, if you watch Mad Men, the guy with the white hair, plays Roger, great guy, great actor, great in commercials. And in the commercials, they're shooting this um, where, and it's a commercial for a product that a guy, you know, a middle aged guy. And he's, he's looking here, and they're shooting him this way, and he's talking over here, and not once does he engage me to do it. I wouldn't buy that product if they gave me a coupon. Because they're not trying to reach me, they're trying a gimmick. There is no human connection here. If I read a Facebook post, and I read, I, I troll Facebook all the time because I've got two, two sites. I've got my, my regular personal page, which is maxed out at 5,000 people. And I've got an author page. And I've got how many thousands of people I have on that, 14 or 15,000 on that. Um, I have never, I've always grown it organically. I like, I prefer doing that than gimmicks. I don't gimmick the growth of it. If I see a Facebook page that I like, I'll, re, you know, I'll, I'll repost it, retweet it. If it's something that's, that's reaching out to people, having fun with people. And if it's something that, if I see somebody slamming something, I usually unfriend them, even if they're a potential paying customer. Because they're not part of the vibe that I want to play. That is, is the, the, the kind of the core of how I run my business as a writer. Even though I write horrific stuff, I write stuff about the world ending and zombies eating flesh. My online presence, if you, if you get a chance, go to my page sometimes, Jonathan Mayberry, uh, you know, look up Facebook, spell my name right, no wire, no last name, Jonathan Mayberry. Half of what I, I post, even two thirds of what I post, is fun. I'm just having fun out there. I'm the, I'm the, it's a safe page to come to for fun. I put up funny stuff. I'm never political. I'm never nasty. Uh, I find intelligent humor and throw that up. There's a couple of absurdisms. Pictures of my dog. If I have nothing else to put up, because people love dogs, and I love my dogs, I put a picture of my dog. My dog gets fan mail, by the way. Addressed to her. <laughs> Not to me, the owner of the dog. It goes to the dog. I actually get fan mail 
I introduced the dog in, in King of Plagues for the, the hero. The dog, the fictional dog gets banned. <laughs> so I started, I actually had a contest on Facebook to name the dog when I was going to put the dog in. Um, it was what taught me the value of contests. 12,822 recommendations for the name of the dog. That was my biggest up to that point Facebook response. Since then, I've done contests, you know, whoever, you know, comes up with, with a cool name for a character, I'll put you in the book and I'll kill you off. <laughs> Tens of thousands of suggestions. People are weird, and I love that. Um, the whole thing about the way I do, I do social media, you know, is I'm out there having fun, and that's what they see. As I said earlier, it's got to be fun. Fun is the first thing. If I put product advertisement up, like right now I had a comic book come out today, uh, the third issue of viewers, so yeah, I have to pick that, because up there, it doesn't say, go buy this. It says this. This is what's out there. And then I go on to something else, and I post something, I'll post something funny afterwards. I don't beat that course. I, I just let them see it, that it's there, and move on. Um, that actually sells more. I, I mean, we've tracked some of the sales bikes. When I push less, I sell more. When I engage more, I sell more. When I try to sell, my numbers drop. Because we look at what Barnes & Noble and Amazon and everything else are doing after posts, after you know Facebook and Twitter posts. And we can see spikes up and down. The more fun I have, even if I go and talk about The Walking Dead, Walking Dead is, you know, I, I have a TV show headed, headed to, uh, uh, I have a show, a book headed to TV right now that will be in competition with The Walking Dead. I'm friends with everyone there on The Walking Dead. I pimp their show all the time, even though it doesn't, it, it's not my product, but it sells my books too. And it, it makes a statement that it's not a competition. I want to close with this one, one little thing about, about the writing business, about not, not a competition, because it applies to social media too. In the writing business, there are two camps. One camp is people who think that if you help someone else, you give someone a lead to an agent, or you give someone you know, uh, a recommendation for a con they can go to or something, if you help someone else, they're going to get your spot, and you're not. And they're going to profit, and you're going to fail. And that is a very powerful camp. It's fear-based, and it's infectious, and it's dangerous. The other camp, what I like being in, is the one that believes that if people help each other, if writers help each other, then more good books will get out to the public, whether they are conventionally published or self-published. More product will get out there, more people will, will be reading good books, more people will be reading, and all of publishing will move forward and prosper. In that camp, we are all happily rowing at oars on the same ship. We are having fun with it. That's the only camp I would want to work in. It's how I do my social media, it's how I do my writing, it's how I do my teaching. It's the only way that you can have fun and make everything a win-win, and at the same time, everyone moves forward in a way, in a way without feeling for shackled or, or slogging through mud. The, 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 the no fear approach. I'll pimp somebody else's product, even if it's a direct competition of mine, because those readers are also my readers. And we also, we all, their readers, my readers, that other writer, and I, all love that genre, we wouldn't be talking about it. So why wouldn't we all want to make kids playing in the, in the playground together? If I'm the one bringing the toys, then fine, I bring the toys. Somebody else brings them, I'll play with their toys. But it's all about having fun, and that's a huge, huge thing. So I'm going to open up the questions at this point. Fantastic. Let's get Dan up here as well. We're going to do a Q&A uh, on, on several talks. And I want to actually, aside from the takeaway of utilizing canines in your posts and other things that are very strong, what would you say people could do or what resources were out there if they wanted to say, look, I want people to like what I'm talking about. I have a, a site that talks about whatever, new grown hairs. How am I going to keep people on my site? Or is there a formula? Is there a process? Is there something people can do, a trick to kind of help them engage? Well, I, I resist I resist the word trick, by the way. Uh, my friend, Don, tried to get me to use that. I, 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 um, but I, I, the point, I, I definitely get it. There are, there are, there are techniques. Which is another word for trick. There are, there are techniques that I like using. One of which is, what's the story in that? 
if it's if it's well, for example, a friend of mine uh, was in advertising, is in advertising, and he was hired to promote the campaign. It'll be on TV in a, in a few months to sell tickets to the Mets. That's pretty hard to sell tickets to the Mets sometimes. <laughs> the final baseball. So he, we were sitting around, and he was, you know, all about his, his the stats of the Mets and the. The, the come from behind kids and all that you know that stuff. I'm like, yeah, so what? You know, the, the, the guy who's taking his, his ten year old kid to the to the ballpark was probably in kindergarten when some of this stuff happened. It's not relevant to him. What's relevant to him? So I gave him a scenario. Just I said, all right, guy sitting there reading the paper, bam, baseball comes through his, his window, shatters you know the glass, laying on the floor. He picks up, was really mad, looks out, sees his kid standing on the lawn, looking horrified with a baseball bat. He really wants to yell at the kid, but he remembers he was that kid, you know, and he's like, he goes outside and he talks to the kid, and, you know, explains you shouldn't be doing this in front of people's houses, and then he talks about baseball, and it just becomes a talk about baseball, and then the next thing you see is that guy and his son and the kid and his father are all sitting in a baseball game, a Mets game. Mets, the least important part of the story. But it's where it ends up. You know, it get, gets everyone that's late to the game. They're actually going to develop that, that commercial. It was just an idea because there's a story there about human connection and the movement away from an anger reaction to a, well, who is this kid and was he? Why was he so excited about playing baseball that he would do it on the front lawn? He must love baseball that much that he will have to play, play it anywhere he can. That became the story. Uh, we got uh, a mic that might blow up, but go ahead. Um, there is a on writing versus publishing. Oh, yeah. The short version of that. Um, writing is something, I actually believe that writers are born with some sort of storytelling gene, like musicians are and so on. There's something that makes us want to do this because it, you know, it's a tough thing to want to do. Um, you can learn some of the, the tricks of being a writer, but the urge to write is natural. You know, it's what, it's what we're born with. And um, when the, the, then we learn the craft of it, which are all the things that you can apply to it to become a good writer. And all of that's part of the art. Um, publishing is not in the business of falling in love with your piece of art. Publishing is in the business of some kinds of art. They don't give a rat's ass about art. I, you know, I've been publishing this for a long time. I know this. Some individual members absolutely love books. That's why they got into publishing. But the industry as a machine just sells copies. If you understand that and understand that it is its job to sell copies, a restaurant's job is to sell plates of food, not to come out and eat it with you and just ask you to praise your butt. That's not the restaurant's job. Sell plates of food. Make it enjoyable, sell plates of food. If you understand it too, if you understand that demands of business are very specific, learn them. Much more, much more successful. I, when I learned about business of publishing, my career and my income went further. Yeah. Question. What's the name of the TV show? I have, I have two shows in development for TV right now. One we actually yeah. haven't mentioned on Twitter or Facebook yet, so please don't. Uh, it's the Joe Cruz series. The book, the, this book, Extinction Machine, just got optioned yesterday for television. Wow. Uh, <laughs> we'll make the announcement. The series is basically weird science and a special ops team. It's like, imagine 24, if Jack Bauer had a sense of humor. <laughs> and the show was written by Michael Crichton. So it's weird science and special ops. Um, the sixth book, the one, one of the ones we're giving out tonight, uh, Code Zero, the fifth one, and, it, and uh, it's a good option. The other show that's, that's on the way to television is V Wars. Uh, that's, we, we just signed Tim, uh, Tim Schlott, who was the head writer for Dexter, uh, as our head writer. And he's writing for Tyler right now, and uh, we're very excited about that. So the two shows heading to TV. And two books, Dead of Night and Rock Rowan heading to the movies. So, <laughs> <laughs> See, now I put it.
put it down at such words. Um, All right. Good luck. Um, so given that obviously you just you're having success with optioning to TV and movies, how do you feel about the convergence of traditional media with digital? I absolutely love them. Here, here's the thing about digital media. People. How do I say this to that person? Um, a lot of folks think that writers have an acrimonious relationship with digital media. We don't. We hate digital piracy. We hate that a whole lot. You know, I, I have over 600,000 illegal downloads of my books per year. I don't like that at all. But digital publishing is fantastic. When you know, every one of my books is in print, audio, and digital. The books are available everywhere somebody wants to get a book, as they should be. Everything that a consumer wants should be available in any form they want, right away. In, uh, cur you know, cater to impulse buy, cater to whatever is their way of reading. I read, you know, I, I love print. I read on, on, on a Kindle because I travel, so I can't carry books around. So I, 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 I read audio or, or listen to audio or read digital. I love digital. Uh, I've done projects that are digital only too. Um, so yeah, d digital rocks. And anyone who thinks that digital is not a major part of the future of publishing uh, really needs their meds checked. <laughs> So my journalistic follow-up question, um, how do you work to convert that audience to your own, your own, owned, your, eh, saying that badly, but how do you work to convert the audience who's stealing into a more permanent, loyal member and follower? The audience that's stealing? Mm -hmm. You can't. Um, they, they, Random House did a, a big study about people who go for free content or pirated content. The crossover to purchase is less than 1%. They're not going to get stuff, and pay, start paying for stuff, and they continue to get it for free. Uh, so we don't, you know, we go after them to try to shut them down, but we don't try to sell them. I try to sell them to people who are thinking about maybe I should try digital. Sure. You know, here, I'll tell you all the reasons why digital is cool. I'll tell you all the reasons why print is not dead and why audio is a lot of fun when you're driving. But I'm not going to try to convert someone whose desire is for free content because they're not actually my, my sales demographic. And I want them all to die. <laughs> Good way. So uh, two questions. Um, when you make your agreements with your publishers, do you have you do you normally find that you enjoy the covers that you get? Graphic wise, and then I'll get you that one. I have never had successful input on a book cover yet. Um, I, I, they don't. They occasionally ask me my opinion. More so since I've been a bestseller, they ask my opinion, but they don't actually follow my my, my suggestions. And it's a good thing because my suggestions wouldn't make very good book covers. Um, so, but and I've, I've liked almost all of my book covers. There was one nonfiction book. That had a cover that I know for sure hurt sales of the book. I've been told by booksellers that it's the worst book cover they've, they've seen in years. And that book is the only one of my books that that uh, uh, not only, that didn't earn out its events. It's the only one of 58 books. The only one that didn't earn out its events. A bite. It's a nonfiction book about supernatural predators. I interviewed everyone from John Carpenter to Stan Lee. It's a great book. The uh, the cover is horrible. And we'd given them two covers, one so clearly bad that they couldn't pick it. And you know, I, I, I didn't happen to the artist, and one that was absolute no-brainer, gotta use this. They took the wrong one. <laughs> the artist miffed, then went and took the other cover and sold it as a poster and sold 1.6 million copies of the poster. <laughs> yes, I cried a lot on that one. The, the second question is for audio. Do you do you get a say in who reads your books, who records them? Uh, more, so, more so now than before. Um, this is this is audio has had a rebirth. For a long time, audio was not a major component of publishing because it was too expensive. And you know, producing the CDs and so on was very expensive. They were average fifty dollars for an un, an unabridged book. And then streaming came along for audio. Uh, digital downloads, iTunes, you can buy it, Audible, and also the digital recording technology has, has improved. Most of the guys who read uh, audiobooks now do it from home. 
that they set up a little studio in home and they, and they send in the files and they're edited by the editor and producer. Um, because of that, the audiobook market has gone up a tremendous amount. My first audiobooks, we you were know, modest sellers. Um, now we're, we're selling in the high six figures in, in terms of number of units moved for my audiobooks. Some, in some cases, they outsell my print. Um, now, as far as as far as the, the readers, because my books are selling so well, because I, I tend to make friends with the readers. As soon as I hear who's the readers going to be, I make friends with them via Facebook, chat them up, interview them for a blog, become friends with them, and try also try to get them more work. If I get if I sell something to another publisher, I'll suggest them. Now, it's uh, because of that, and because some of these guys have been nominated for awards, Extinction Machine was up for Science Fiction Audiobook of the Year. Um, they now ask my opinion. So about 50% of the time, I can get my way with an audiobook reader. By the end of next year, if my sales continue to go the way they're going, I'll be able to dictate who I want, which is good because I want some of the, some of the guys who have been doing them. The guy does the Joe Venture books over there. Um, he's amazing. He's the, I actually hear his voice when I'm writing the, the stories now, which is really freaky. Um, <laughs> and when I do signings in LA, he'll actually come out and do the readings at the book signings uh, because he is the voice of that character. And I've gotten him. I've sold short stories of that character um, to a number of different anthologies, and I'm always, always with the stipulation that if there's an audio, he has to be the reader. And uh, so it, it works out really well. One place to give a more question here. Um, so with, since you've had several uh, dealing with publishers, um, what things do you find, so like your book covers and you know, and who, who does your readings? Uh, what, what things do you find that you have learned to take more control over versus, you know, things that you think you could do better that you have been able to do better versus things you just kind of let go? Well, jacket copy, for one thing. Uh, I, write, I write the jacket copy for my books now. Usually that doesn't happen. Writers aren't asked to. I'm, I'm a pretty good copywriter, so, and I know what the story's about. And nowadays, um, I'm, my, my, because of where I am in my career, the novel that I'm writing, well, I just turned into a novel last week. The cover was done months ago, my, so and that book that I turned in last week will be out in March. So it's on a very fast track um, because of that, uh, and because the covers are be done much sooner than the book. I have to write the copy, and if they, it's now a go-to thing where I write the copy. I also write the solicitation uh, copy for my comments. I want, I know what I want to say. I know what the heart of the story is, and uh, so that, that that's been my major influence on, on the design of the book. Um, and that, that's, that's been significant enough. Okay, you know, also, I, I cover quotes. You know, I, I got James Rollins, no, it's not I got James Rollins to give me a cover quote for uh, Patient Zero. I know for a fact that that sold a lot of books to his fans. And he's, he's the number one New York Times bestseller. And now Jim and I are good friends, and he just asked me for a cover quote for his next book, which is extremely cool. You know, it's like Stephen King asking uh, somebody who joined the business afterwards for a cover quote, that kind of thing. You know, it's very excited about it. Cool. This question for, uh, for Dan. So, so let's uh, pretend that, you know, you got Jonathan here who just wrote an amazing article on infectious disease in the world's mouth and town. How are you going to distribute it? What's the first couple steps you're going to take? I don't know if I'm the right guy. I think he's. I think he's already talked about that. I think distribute one of his stories. Yeah, or, you know, yeah. Or whatever, like, through social, you gotta use yeah. the last lines, things like that. <clears throat> I think John's better, better answer to this one. Um, yeah, go for it. No, no, no. I mean, you've been doing, you've been doing this stuff. So, I mean, I have, I have a target. You can, you can do a lot of Facebook ads. You can really narrow down and target people that are interested in, in horror and and reading, and you can really narrow it down, and you can give away books to those that that target audience, and um, do all some free things, do some contests to those people, and advertise to. That's one cool thing about Facebook; you can really narrow down that demographic, and then keep providing other kind of materials that they would be interested in. That's that's that way. And point it back to your to your own blog or whatever you're doing with um, with your books. Uh, is that what you're looking for? So. I just want to tag one thing on that. You touched on the, uh, giveaways and contests and so on. I actually find that to be much more effective than a contest where they can win a signed copy of the book. Because then they'll have pause before buying the book or 
beautiful. So I actually don't do contests to give away copies of my books. I do contests to avoid other things. And that drives sales of the book, and it also drives you know, likes, followers, shares, and so on. Um, and often I'll hashtag, I, I get a lot of mileage out of hashtags. Which I, at first I thought, this is stupid, it's not going to, you know, hashtag, come on. Now, I, you know, I, 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 I almost put hashtags when I sign a check, you know, it's like, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, because they really do work. And, uh, uh, every social uh, pretty, almost, almost every post has a hashtag of some sort. Uh, unless it's a link to a movie, in which case the link, you know. Um, but I'll, I'll put hashtags in my Facebook post because that my Facebook post then go to my, my Twitter feed. So. I have time for two more questions. Uh, right here in front. <laughs> okay, so this is kind of a marketing question, but being somebody that is still very much in the you know, traditional publishing arena, um, would you say nowadays that uh, the the efforts of the people that are actually being paid to market your book, you know, all people in the marketing department and the publishing uh, well, with the publishers, would you say that those people are just as effective as just your own efforts? Or do you think that your, your own efforts of just being on just blogging and social media are actually more effective than they are? Well, my answer to that would be different last year. Uh, most of the publicists I've worked with, I, I, I write for seven publishers. So most of the publishers I work with, um, a lot of people in publicity and marketing um, are, are old. And by old, I mean over 30. Um, and a lot of them, they're, they're, they have to learn social media after they get that job, rather than they get that job because they know social media. All the publicists I have now are barely out of diapers. And they are burning it up, getting, me, getting my stuff out there everywhere. They're innovative. Um, they, they do stuff that I would never think of. Great example, this 19-year-old assistant publicist at St. Martin's came with this great idea. Now, even though The Walking Dead show will be on a different network than my show, the novels they publish are published by the same publisher who does my Joe Ledger series. Um, so they said, well, they have a Facebook page that has over a million you know, likes. Would you be willing to take it over for a week? And just be the curator of the page. Because usually it's not, it's just curated by somebody who just puts posts up. And I said, absolutely. So I went on there and I just had fun. I did contests. I, I, I did one contest where, you know, um, uh, make a statement about your favorite zombie movie and why, and uh, you, I'll kill you in my next zombie movie. Um, you know, stuff like that. We had hundreds of thousands of likes. Actually, we had one, we had over a million uh, people reached. Um, tens of thousands of shares. I mean, it was, it was insane because it was directly engaging them. The writers of those books, Robert Kirkman who does the comic and J. Uh, J. Gordon Singer who does the novels, don't go on to that page. There's no one for them to relate to other than they could just put a comment when, when a post is up. I was directly engaging them. And the way to do it, by, when I write, I write 50 minutes out of every hour and I do 10 minutes of social media every hour, eight hours a day. So I'm hitting social media eight times 10 minute blocks. So eight times I'm going back to that page and pumping it up and doing stuff and responding, hitting likes to, to every one of their posts, putting up goofy stuff, putting up fun stuff, engaging. The follows to my website, we had, uh, in the, by the end of the first week, we had 116,000 people visit my website. Unique visitors who had never been there before. And we, you know, they had to be from that. So, uh, yes, uh, the, the public, that was a publicist, 19 year old publicist I did. Her boss would never have thought of it. Her boss was 34. Um, now, there are some, I do know one publicist who's 39 who actually is immature like I am, so they think like a kid and that works really well. Um, but I, I think he's actually learning from his interns how to, how to think, you know, fun and edgy. You know, not the conventional model, but, you know, this is weird, let's try this. And the this is weird, let's try this model, I love it. Um, All right, you can do right here. Uh, this, the question is for Dan. I'm really uh, interested in uh, what Hold on a second, I get kind of in a zone and listen to zombies. <laughs> yeah, you're, gonna, you're ready. I'm going to have to shift back to nature and sunshine. Okay. I'm so curious about um, what you did with her face. Okay. And so uh, tell us about what, how that transition from not getting shares to getting 
thousands of shares almost, how that looked like and how was was it overnight, like doing problem solving posts, um, how did that like affect and how did the, the, the step by step look like and how it affected the website, uh, the web traffic? And yeah, let me, uh, I'll try to address it all. Let me know if they don't. Um, <laughs> There's kind of a tipping point when they got it. it when they got there, it was about 4,000 fans. And once it got above 10,000 fans, and we started seeing which posts really connected, and it's, it really started multiplying fast. Um, we did use our email list, though, as well. We, our email list is pretty big of trying to drive people from email to our Facebook page. Um, the thing that they, they had not done this stuff at all, except for posting, here's a special, buy this, buy this. And so for the people that like Nature Sunshine, they really like the product. Um, it was refreshing for them, I think, to have a, a different way to connect with the brand. Um, and so, yeah, there's a tipping point where it kind of happened. And once you kind of figure out your sweet spot, the things that connect, you just hit it harder. Like those um, reflexology charts I showed you, those started getting shared a ton. So I was trying to find all kinds of reflexology charts, right? Um, and we did some more things too that didn't show up there. We did a little bit of paid uh, stuff to try to get more fans and try to reach people that are interested in herbs and stuff like that. But it was like 20 bucks here and there, or 300 bucks a month. But the, the one thing that the posts I showed you, those were not boosted with paid. There was too much text, so they wouldn't allow it. Most of those posts anyway. And those were all organic ones. The organic ones still a lot perform the paid ones. Um, but as far as traffic to the site, it uh, you know once we got like thirty thousand fans, and we did have a special. I had to put specials every day anyway. That was what those people above me wanted. Um, but those, those did better because you have a bigger fan base anyway, right? And like I, we tried some more things with the special before. It was like get twenty percent off this herb, you know. And then we tried to do more of you can eat. This is ways you can use the herb, and you get the special special right now. This is the way to do things for the body, and this is um, different uses and whatever, and etc. Um, in the health industry, though, there are legal things you can't say this will cure that, so there is a little challenge with it. Um, but some of the general health, we did a lot of food stuff too, and um, the benefits of bananas and stuff like that. You get a picture of a banana and say, "Here's a ben here's a list of benefits," and people are like, "Oh, that's awesome." You know, here, here's four ways to make almond milk. You know, those, those kind of things did really well too. Do you get as much engagement with 20% off discount? Do you get like no. likes and No. No. And, and then there's a reason for those things too, because you want people to buy your product too. Um, but it's never as much engagement. With those other posts, you're engaging the, the core customers, but you're also engaging, engaging people that are um, not ready to be customers yet. And you hope that they will eventually be customers, you know, as much as you're giving them advice on how to be healthy and stuff like that. Did you, you guys that. have tactics in taking the shares and, and bringing it into the site? And having yeah, them? sure. We have everything that we, that we do is thought of as a funnel, um, a HubSpot funnel, where you have uh, people that are the awareness, and then you, there's things bringing back to the blog or to parts of the site that. In ways you can they can capture their email address, and then there's content. Um, a lot of these are people that resell, or their chiropractor that resells the product to their 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 uh, clients, and so there's would be stuff that would not be on social, but it would be on that chiropractor how they can use the the product to um, help their business too. So there's different content that's engaging, but for a different type of audience for sure. Does that answer your question? Last right. question. Um, what do you think about the medium of video games for storytelling, Justin? And have you taken any steps into that? What did you ask? Answer for you. Sure. <laughs> 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 that now it works. He warmed it up for me. I, I do sometimes think this is an elaborate prank. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, I love video games and I'm competent at them, um, so I don't play them myself. My, my, I used to try to play my son's Tony Hawk skateboard game. I think I would die every time turning it on. <laughs> that said, this is going to be a video game. 
Um, when, they, when the movie comes out, it's about 18 months away from being, coming out, then they're going to do a rock and roll video game. It is not directly drawing on the content of these novels. It's drawing on things that are mentioned in the novels. So it's going to be original, new, new game thing. Uh, we are also working on a board game version of that, um, which is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, kind of like a super version of Risk, which would be really cool. Um, but I've, I've got three different video game projects in development right now. Um, I dread the moment when somebody asks me to play one that's kind of like a, I'm showing up for an event and saying, hey, play the video game, because uh, they, it will just be sad, sad, sad. <laughs> I will die so quickly. Um, what I will probably do once the games are out is interview the game writers and game designers for, for a blog post. Uh, maybe maybe uh, do it as a recorded uh, audio video interview, throw it up on YouTube, um, and also I'll throw a bunch of contests together. I'll, I'll get kids to play it. I'll like for a couple of the games, like the, the board games. Uh, I'm already talking to comic book stores around the country. We're going to have a nationwide contest to play that game, and the winners of it get to be in the comic. They actually photo. I mean, the, the artists will do interpretations of them, and they will be in the comic. So they'll they'll get that. You know, as a prize. I know we will get thousands upon thousands of kids who will. There'll be thousands of thousands of kids getting involved. We'll sell the game and we'll also sell the books. And that's big. Um, that's dumb. Um, no, uh, uh, so that's because of, yeah, the battery's not. So, thank you. Let's uh, wrap up the vlog. <laughs> But in the eighth one, SLC SEM needs to be an equal organization at the conference. The same. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll see what I can do. I can be a bow tie. It's made of a bow tie building, Ryan. Exactly. Yeah, you wouldn't be the first. Uh, second, clearly, uh, are we ready to announce a winner? Yeah, I'll announce that winner. You're announcing that winner. All right. Yeah. He's got a winner for the first contest, so if you want to go attend their badass summit, pay attention. All right, thanks everybody for coming out.